It is very lovely to be here on this pretty much empty stage, but I know that uh, many of you are online and our panelists are online. So um, it's, it's just really exciting to be, to be here to talk to you about women's leadership and women's leadership role in the transition to low carbon economies. My name is Erin Tanzi. I am the director of the Sustainable Inclusive Economies Division at the International Development Research Center based in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, and I'm really delighted to be given this opportunity to moderate this panel of exceptional leaders whom you'll meet uh, in, in a few moments, and they're from all over the world. So in my 20 plus years of working in international development, um, I've had the privilege really to witness outstanding achievements spearheaded by otherwise ordinary women and men. And what struck me is that very often the narration of those transformations are, or the transformative, transformative changes would pay little to no credit to women and to the women involved in, in these changes. And why is that? Mainly because women are often invisible. So it's really uh, with lots of enthusiasm that I, I welcome this diverse panel uh, to share with us what they're seeing on the ground when it comes to women's role in spearheading the transition to low carbon economies. But before that, allow me to invite uh, IDRC's acting president, Julie Scholdeis, to give her opening remarks. Uh, prior to uh, joining IDRC as the Vice President for Policy Regions and, um, and Strategy Regions and Policy, Julie was uh, Canada's Ambassador to uh, Cote d'Ivoire and Liberia, and she's worked in several international agencies, including the Canadian International Development Agency and the United Nations World Food Program. So Julie, floor is yours. Thanks so much, Erin, and uh, hello and welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining us uh, this morning for this panel discussion on women's leadership in the transition to low carbon economies. Uh, C'est un grand plaisir d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui pour cet échange important sur le leadership féminin um, vers les économies plus vertes. Et c'est un grand plaisir pour le CRDI, le Centre de recherche pour le développement international, de collaborer à cette discussion aujourd'hui. So just a bit of a word about the International Development Research Center, IDRC. IDRC is a Canadian Crown Corporation. As part of Canada's foreign affairs and development efforts, IDRC champions and funds research and innovation um, within and alongside developing regions to drive global change. Climate action and achieving gender equality are long-standing priorities in our work. For more than 15 years, we've contributed to climate research capacity across the Global South, including through strengthening the capacity of climate change experts and leaders, especially women. IDRC-supported research has helped, for example, inform more than 35 adaptation and development policies and plans at both the local and national levels. As we've been discussing at this conference over the last two days, all economies face the decarbonization challenge, including low and middle income countries deeply affected by climate change and committed to building a low carbon future. These investments that we're making will help position their economies to adapt and thrive. But new economic opportunities will not by default benefit everyone equally. Women tend to be disproportionately affected by the impact of climate change and are likely to miss out on new opportunities unless we focus on their inclusion and promote their leadership. The barriers to women's economic empowerment have worsened due to crises, most especially COVID-19 and the lockdowns we've all experienced, but also extreme climate events and more recently global inflation challenges of which we're all very aware. These crises are more deeply impacting Global South sectors where women are often overrepresented, such as informal work, healthcare, and tourism. The impact of these crises on family members and public services place additional burdens on women as primary caregivers. Solutions must be developed with active participation and leadership from women at all levels from the micro and small enterprises using low carbon innovations to prominent business leaders. So to that end, today you'll hear from leaders who are piloting promising women-led solutions for green economies, including innovations in agriculture, 
forestry, land restoration, and tourism. The potential is great for women's leadership in the low carbon transition. But to achieve this potential, we have to address barriers that are keeping women-led businesses in survival mode. We have to find ways to help those women and their businesses to flourish. Now these solutions must come from the women who are running the businesses. They know the barriers and they know how to overcome them. They are the ones ultimately best placed to identify the low carbon practices, business models and policies that reflect their realities, their communities and their vision for a low carbon future. So I have no doubt today's discussion will be a fascinating one. On behalf of IDRC, I wish you an excellent discussion with a very talented and experienced panel. Je vous remercie et je vous souhaite une excellente conférence. Merci beaucoup and back to you, Erin. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. So as, as you just heard Julie say, um, you know, all economies face the decarbonization challenge and the barriers to women's economic empowerment because of COVID, the lockdowns, because of climate change are, 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 are very heavy. So IDRC's response to, to this uh, was to launch last year a $10 million research initiative, um, a, a real research to policy initiative to address the gender barriers that hinder women's access to economic opportunities while supporting sustainable climate resilient uh, recovery of, uh, of the pandemic. So we're at the moment funding 12 projects, 12 research projects in this group, um, and they're running as we speak. Um, and they are all aiming to ensure that low and middle income countries responses to the challenges of climate change and the COVID recovery are more inclusive and more sustainable. And the projects were selected after we did a call for proposals. I think we received over 400 submissions. So there was a lot of interest out there. And the 12 projects that we selected um, stood out mainly because of their relevance and their responsiveness to local challenges. And of course, clear plans for impact on public policies and, and, and on actions. So the projects, um, and so three of which you'll hear about today, are exploring how pandemic recovery efforts can support marginalized communities. They'll also help advance climate action while contributing to women's economic empowerment. I know it sounds like a huge task, but wait till you hear from our panelists. Uh, so this work is really an example of Canada's feminist uh, international assistance policy um, and um, it also advances the st sustainable development goals agreed upon by the international community and helps to address uh, national development challenges faced by uh, developing countries. What's also unique about the initiative is that local experts are partnering with the private sector and civil society um, to diagnose the challenges and then to co-construct solutions um, in a way that speaks really to the local context. So from Africa to Asia to Latin America and the Middle East, many solutions are being tested. Uh, many of these research projects are led by women. All of the projects uh, are implemented uh, by a mixed research team uh, of women and men, which is very important. And uh, gender equality and inclusion considerations are integral and an integral part of their work. So from data collection uh, and analysis also to stakeholder engagement. This already gives you a bit of an idea uh, of how women are doing their fair share uh, to advance climate action and gender equality through the production of sound evidence feeding into decision making. So at the sort of at the research at the research level. But to learn more about women's leaderships, women's leadership role, um, let's hear now finally from our panelists who are really at the forefront of some groundbreaking initiatives in the Global South. Um, I will introduce each panelist as they are about to speak so you remember more about who they are. Uh, so I, our first panelist, uh, Lucky Anderson, wish you were all here on the stage with me, but 
uh, that'll be for another another year. Um, so Lukia is the um, executive director of Sustainable Development Solutions Network in Bolivia. So she's been for more than 25 years uh, conducting research on environment and development in Latin America in, in vari a variety of capacities, including as scientific manager at Conservation International Bolivia and as a consultant for the World Bank the Inter-American Development Bank, and the United Nations. So lovely to have you here, uh, Lucky, and, um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So my first question to you is, um, you know, you're working to generate the evidence that will, will guide investments in gender equal and sustainable tourism in Bolivia. So how can low carbon tourism promote gender equality at a scale that makes a difference um, in communities that are recovering from the pandemic? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this panel. Let me just explain first why we chose to focus on tourism as a potential engine of sustainable and gender inclusive development in Bolivia. It's because uh, a couple of years ago, we made a detailed diagnostic about how each of um, Bolivia's 339 municipalities were doing uh, on the advancing towards the uh, sustainable development goals. And we found two main characteristics that were associated with higher sustainable development scores. And one was being proud of a metropolitan area. And the other was significant tourism uh, activity. So we set out to investigate exactly why tourism seems so promising for sustainable development and, uh, and, and this is thanks to, to the support of IDRC. So before the pandemic, tourism was the fourth most uh, important sector generating foreign revenue in Bolivia and it was growing three times faster than all the other export sectors. And Bolivia really has tremendous potential for nature and culture and adventure-based tourism. And our destination has historically had a very low carbon footprint, about the same as Yemen, so really close to zero. <laughs> and that's because um, tourists tend to be backpackers coming by bus from Peru, and they like to enjoy our spectacular nature and uh, like by going down the famous death road by bike and uh, climb mountains and engage in other really low impact activities. And then an additional benefit of tourism is that it generates a wide variety of jobs and especially for women. We calculated that 72% of all labor income uh, accrues to women, uh, which is pretty much the opposite of the other sectors in the economy. For example, in agriculture, only 29% of labor incomes go to women. This, of course, also means that women were hit particularly hard by the pandemic. Uh, more than 100,000 women lost their jobs as tourism just plummeted to almost zero, while the agricultural sector almost didn't feel the, the pandemic at all. Mm. So we want to promote women in the tourism sector because they seem to have a, a, a comparative advantage there. And, and that's to really compensate for the disadvantages just that they suffer in the rest of the economy. Yeah, fa fascinating. Um, and I'm looking down because I can see the screen here. I can see the panelists on, on, uh, on the screen right in front of me. So, then if I can just continue with you, uh, Loki, like in your view, what, what must be done for women to be able to play this, this leading role in, in sustainable tourism in Bolivia, but even maybe in the region? Well, in Bolivia, women are already playing the leading role in the tourism sector. We analyzed the, all the tourism enterprises in the register of formal enterprises in Bolivia over the last three decades and we found that the share of tourism enterprises that are owned by women have increased from 42 percent in the 90s to 54 percent in the 2010s thus by now women are really dominating the tourism sector even at the highest levels and in the largest and most formal enterprises the share of women might actually be higher uh, in the informal sector but that's difficult to know due to the lack of data 
And of course, even though women are already doing uh, really well in the sector, there's still a lot of room for improvement. And for our IDIRC funded project, we have partnered with an institution with more than 20 years of experience in community-based tourism and other innovations in social entrepreneurship. And they will be working directly with the female-led uh, enterprises, while at SDSN will work mainly to affect public policy. Fantastic. Thank you for those insights from, from Latin America. Wonderful. Um, so now let's uh, uh, hear from Amy Melissa Chua. Um, Amy is the country director of the Philippines Partnership for Sustainable Agriculture. And in her, some of her previous positions, uh, Amy worked as uh, one, of the lar the, one of the largest um, corporate foundations in the Philippines and uh, contributed to the creation of the group's first crowdfunding platform that caters to various nonprofits uh, nationwide. So Amy, uh, you, you are creating the business case for advancing women's economic empowerment and climate smart agriculture in Cambodia, the Philippines, and also in Vietnam. So which value chains are you focusing on and what roles uh, will public and private actors need to play to, ch to really achieve sustainability? Um, first of all, uh, and good evening. Good morning and good evening from the Philippines. The project, which we call AGRI or the ASEAN Green um, Recovery through Equity and Empowerment, is being implemented, as you said, by Grow Asia and the country partnerships and research partners in three countries Vietnam, Philippines, and Cambodia. And each of these countries is focusing on different agri value chains. So for Vietnam, we are focusing on the rice value chain. And our in country team in Vietnam um, looked at the criteria around uh, number one. One, the participation of women, and we learned that women um, account for 50% of the rice producers in Vietnam. Number two, um, potential for decarbonization. We also learned that rice farming significantly contributes to methane emissions worldwide. Mm. And of all the greenhouse gases produced by um, the Vietnam, 15% uh, is from rice. This is from the report of the International Rice Research Institute in Vietnam. In the Philippines, we just conducted a workshop last year to elaborate on the selection parameters and adopt a more um, consultative and participatory approach in selecting the value chain focus of the project. So based on that workshop, the in-country um, field interviews and also the desk research that we, that we are doing, it seems like that we are leaning towards rice, coffee, or corn um, based off, of course, the potential impact on women in the sector at large, the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, potential um, market, and also existing partners um, within our network. So based on the learning parameters and the learning agenda of the uh, coming research outcomes, uh, we might be able to choose two of the three uh, value chains that I mentioned. Um, in Cambodia, on the other hand, um, our project team is um, adopting a scoring tool to finalize the value chain. But based on the recent discussions, uh, it seems that we are pointing towards horticulture and vegetable um, value chains. Vegetable, particularly due to the numerous, numerous opportunities around mitigation and adaptation on the vegetable value chain, and also the opportunities for livelihoods and the income for women for farmers and agripreneurs. Um, on your next point on the private and public sector players, so I'll start with the private sector. Uh, we know that there's over 100 um, in the ASEAN population that are engaged in micro, small, and medium enterprises. And this shows a huge potential to promote and advance um, women economic empowerment in low carbon transition. So what we want to do through the project is to identify incentives and also interventions that can encourage agribusinesses and social enterprises in agriculture to adopt this gender inclusive and climate positive activities and also scale up their um, investments for sustainable development. For the policymakers, based on our recent discussions with them, we learned that they are looking um, at scaling up their gender mainstreaming policies and also um, uh, climate smart agricultural practices uh, to achieve their targets on um, agriculture and land use actors, um, sectors. 
Um, so it's critical, the role of the policymaker is critical to ensure that policies and roadmaps respond to the needs and also the roles of the women producers. So what we really want to um, hold on to is the idea if, that if policies are supportive to this um, climate um, positive and gender transformative approaches of agribusinesses and social enterprises, then we'll see an increased adoption um, of these um, sustainable uh, activities. Fantastic. Wow. Lots, lots of information and three, three countries to sort of compare, compare with. That's, uh, that's, that's great. But I'll just continue with you and ask you how, how you intend then to, to promote women's leadership um, in, in national and regional recovery and climate action plans for, for the agriculture sector. So um, the, the AGRI project that we are working on with uh, the IDRC um, is under um, one of four regional flagships of Grow Asia that's on women economic empowerment, which aims to amplify the business case of we or women economic empowerment and also um, incentivize investments um, towards actions and policies. So um, we are pushing for this because we believe that the role of women um, and empowering them will um, greatly um, affect or support um, uh, activities towards, of course, uh, inclusive and sustainable economies and increasing responsible agriculture investments in various um, countries. So um, for that project, what we hope to do is to contribute in the advancement of research and produce a catalog of what's needed and what works and identify strategies um, that could contribute, of course, as mentioned, to gender transformative practices and climate positive actions. So we are doing this through a multi-stakeholder approach, um, of course, to promote um, collaborative um, actions. Um, we are also looking at effective engagement strategies um, by understanding our target stakeholders and looking at the evidence that they best respond to. So for example, for private sector players, they best respond to um, learning from other peers and also how to methods and activities, while policymakers um, best respond to timely actionable items. So what we hope to do is move from um, no harm to gender, to women and environment towards um, building agricultural value chains that are inclusive and sustainable. So that's how we are working on um, in promoting the advancing leadership of women in low carbon economies. Fascinating. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that insight from, from, from Asia. Uh, and now we'll go to our, our third our third panelist. Um, I will I will just introduce. So Divine uh, Foundem Tita is a scientist at the World uh, Agroforestry Center in Cameroon, and he's been working on gender issues in, in agroforestry value chains, especially non non timber forest products, for the past twenty years. And he's also written and published extensively on the same topics. Lovely to have you, Divine. Thank you so much. So, you know, you're part of a team uh, that seeks to improve ongoing restoration of degraded uh, lands in different parts of the country, different parts of Cameroon. Can you tell us a little bit more about the importance of strong women's leadership in land restoration and how that helps to transition to uh, a net zero economy? Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, women in land restoration initiatives in Cameroon. I think I will begin by first of all presenting the challenges of uh, land degradation in Cameroon. Mm. You know, we all know uh, that land degradation is a serious challenge that affects uh, mankind, especially that it affects food security, it leads to higher food prices, climate change, and also biodiversity loss. And in Cameroon, we have about one third of uh, the, the Cameroon uh, surface area, which is about 50 million hectares, is either, either highly or moderately uh, degraded, um, um, leading, uh, it's highly or moderately degraded, uh, with uh, high economic uh, uh, consequences. For example, uh, it affects a uh, low productivity of crop lands, as well as um, uh, range lands and ecosystem services. These economic losses may range from between 6 to 15 million, uh, million euros as per the last evaluation that was announced from time around 2008. So maybe it's more interesting that we ask the question, what are the factors that contribute to land degradation? And we see how women come to the equation. The issue is that most of the land degradation issues stem from 
uh, the fact that there's a lot of slash and blood agriculture, and with a lot of uh, democratic visual, the uh, population population increasing, there's a lot of extensive agriculture for people in watching into lands. So there's a need to fit the ever increasing uh, 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 population. So all of this with uh, combined with inadequate uh, governance of natural resources actually leads to um, failing, failing uh, land uh, tenure regimes. And uh, one of the major factors is that people are, are poor and, when, and try to find food to live on. And when we talk about poverty, we're talking about uh, 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 food crops and women. And most of the poverty is very high in, uh, in, in rural areas. And when, when we know that uh, one of the causes of land degradation is to produce food, women are really the major, uh, they produce 90% of crops in Cameroon. And about 86% uh, of uh, female labor force contribute to food crops production. So because of this important role that um, women play in uh, agriculture and also um, in food production, they, they are also victims of, uh, uh, of land degradation and also and they are victims of land degradation. So Cameroon has this policy now of wanting to restore about uh, 12 billion hectares of uh, uh, degraded land. So the question we ask is, uh, what role uh, uh, women play? Why should women play an important role? Women are important in this activity because um, they use land differently from men. The choices of the type of land or crop that women want to plant is, is different. Mm -hmm. Also, um, there are also sociocultural or sociocultural socio norms uh, that actually impede uh, the, the women from taking part in land in land decisions. So uh, we also have some also some traditional beliefs that prevent women from adopting um, um, uh, technologies that uh, uh, contribute to to to. To, to restoring land. For example, there is a belief that when women uh, 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 farm across the, across the, the, the contours, it is going to instill, uh, um, uh, it's going to um, uh, reduce the, 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 the ease at which they are going to give birth. So some of these practices actually limit their participation in land restoration activities. Uh, you know, very, very interesting. And I, you know, you brought up the issues like you know gender norms and societal norms and practices and beliefs that 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 all play play into in into this. Um, you just, I guess, an, a follow up in a sense question is really about what you think then is key to promoting women's not just participation but leadership in in land restoration practices. Um, one of the first things we think we have to do is to come up with interventions that will actually improve women's access uh, to land, uh, and, uh, technology, gene plasm, knowledge and extension. Let me use the case of extension. You know, most of the time when we do land restoration ex uh, exercises, because we know that land issues are mostly that of men, we keep women aside. But we have that rule, we have that responsibility of, um, of um, bring up interventions that will increase or strengthen women and leadership role in taking decisions when land use planning. We have to make sure we include the ladies to, to, to decide which lands that they want to, to restore, which crops they want to plant on those land, and how to, to better organize themselves to negotiate and advocate for, for policies that we are, are going to increase their access uh, uh, to land. We also need to make sure that we come up with interventions that enhance control over income because we know that when women find benefits of land restoration activities that are going to take part in, 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 in actually carrying out land restoration activities. For example, if they have markets for their products, it's going to be easy for them to plant those trees that are easy for them to, to market. So we also come try to say that we improve women's capacity to be able to take part in, in advocacy processes, to take part in, in, in negotiations, to talk to policymakers. Most of the time, women participate in these activities just as um, people, uh, just for uh, presence, they, they just uh, attend, but they don't actually take part. So how can we, what we do is to build their capacity to be able to take part in discussions, actually actively take part in discussions, talking to policymakers, and also do some advocacy. So in the project we are carrying out with uh, the IDRC, uh, thanks to the funding from the IDRC, we try to see, to study ongoing uh, land restoration initiatives to see what constraints actually exist that 
prevent women to have access to the land, to take them to, uh, what constraint do they have in actually taking part in, 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 in actively in, in, in advocacy and uh, land use uh, planning exercises. So these are some of the things that we do in order to actually engage women in land use and Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Divine. That was uh, very good. And now you've, you've just touched on something that I uh, well, in, in my team at IDRC, we spend a lot of time thinking about, which is uh, the, the unpaid care responsibilities, the paid and unpaid care responsibilities of women and, and, and girls, and, and how often that hinders their ability to participate fully in their economies. So I'm just going to, we've got a few extra minutes, so I'm just going to uh, ask you a, a sort of a, all just a, a, another one more question, if you don't mind. Um, so, you know, given the unequal share of unpaid care work that falls on women, how can innovations in the care economy enable women to lead in building low carbon economies? Um, I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Lucky, if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I think uh, probably women tend to choose actually to work in the tourism sector because it's more flexible and more compatible with uh, taking care of, of family obligations at the same time. So I think that's part of the explanation why the tourism sector is so dominated by women. It's just, mm. it works better with all the, the big variety of obligations that women have in, in this world. Great. Okay. And uh, and you, Amy? Um, this is not uh, directly covered by the project, but this has been um, raised too in some of our discussions. So I am a mother myself, and in caring for my son, I try to look for um, or check the possible effects of whatever I give him, whether food, gadgets, or whatever the environment that we are in, and stay away from those harmful um, um, effects or activities. If we are to relate this to agriculture, we found out in our discussions that women farmers tend to be more aware of the effects of non-organic um, farm inputs to, to their bodies them, um, and the health of their, their children. With this, we see that um, women could be like natural ambassadors of low, car low carbon economies. Hmm. So if we can capitalize on this via innovations, we can talk millions of uh, women champions and advocates in, in this low carbon transition. That's inter yeah, interesting perspective, and and you, divine. Well, I think I will illustrate this with an example we had in uh, while doing some work with uh, women and community forests, where we had to build their capacity to sell some non timber forest products. And in carrying out these activities, uh, we realized that uh, women had to finance some activity. They had to choose which activities they had to to finance with proceeds from um, the, the, the non timber forest products that they generated. They realized that much of their time was spent uh, sometimes when they go to farm in taking care of children. Mm -hmm. So um, since the, 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 their capacity had been empowered to take part in decision making within the community, in choosing which uh, project they had to form, the women opted that a kindergarten be built within the community that would enable them to go, um, yeah, don't enable them to take care, uh, to, to keep the children in their compounds, uh, in, in the kindergartens, and for them to go uh, to the farms. So they actually, I think this was a really positive example because it showed that um, taking care of children is a very important activity for them. And the fact that the proceeds from the non timber forest project was used in building one of a, a kindergarten was very useful uh, for them, and that gave them more time to do uh, farm activities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, would, I think just just even recognizing the the number of hours that that women are are, are spending on these types of activities, um, you know, raises awareness about how many other hours there are. You know, we're all time bound, and there are only twenty four hours in each day, and so you can start to see some of the reasons why maybe women are held back slightly from from being full full participants in their in their own economies in in their businesses and yet even with this kind of uh, extra responsibility they're still managing to 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 lead on in so many ways and like
like like like you've all point pointed out oh i'll just take one more because we've got another minute or two before i ask our um um we we go for our closing closing uh remarks um look could i ask you um you know, one of the things that you talked about was that you 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 are um, your work straddles public policy, but you're also working with the private sector. And I think you know, especially in this audience here in Montreal, there's probably quite a few that are coming maybe from a private sector uh, background. So maybe if you could talk a bit more about your private sector allies in the tourism sector and how they're possibly contributing to advancing your your goals. Yeah, so so what we did in order to unite all these different actors was to create a, a Bolivian Observatory of Sustainable Tourism. And uh, we had like the academic sector with the private sector and local governments participating in this observatory. And we tried to join forces to generate the evidence, generate the arguments needed to influence public policy, which leaves a lot to be desired at the moment in Bolivia. And um, one of the kind of private sector members we have, uh, like the Association of Hotel Owners, the Association of Tour Operators, the Association of Community Tourism Operators, the Association of Private Airlines. So really just a lot of important actors in this sector. And it's it's a pleasure really to, to work with the private sector and feel that that your research is getting used immediately yeah. to, to improve conditions in the sector. Yeah, and it's not just research that's going to sit on a shelf. Um, unfortunately, that I'm not going to be able to. I'm sure that Amy and Divine both would have a very good and interesting answers to that question too. But I'm going to uh, just move on, and uh, we don't have many many minutes left. Um, but it's been really a, a fantastic conversation, and really diverse and diverse examples of where women are leading in in uh, in low low carbon transitions. Um, and you know, I think as Julie did say at IDRC, we believe that women's leadership is essential if we're really going to make significant headway in in the low carbon transition. And so we've heard about what that could look like um, in different countries in different sectors. Um, and now we've got an opportunity to to hear the perspective of a Canadian woman leader uh, in the uh, multilateral arena. Um, so I'd like to invite Chantal Lynn Carpentier, who was here, I think, yesterday, but now is has um, has gone back to her to her home. So she's also joining us um, on, uh, virtually, um, and she's going to provide some closing remarks to this session. So Chantal uh, currently serves as the chief at the UN Conference on Trade and Development (UNCTAD) um, in New York. Um, the, in the New York office of the UN Secretary General. And prior to joining UNCTAD, uh, she served as head of Environment, Economy and Trade Division of the, the North American Free Trade Agreement um, and the uh, Commission for Environmental Cooperation. So, uh, Chantal, uh, over to you. If I, I don't see you on the screen, but maybe you're just joining. Oh, there she, there she is. It's been my plane was delayed, so I just oh. got to my office. I'm still outside. Thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to be on this inspiring panel uh, and for sharing exact, uh, excellent example of how to transitioning towards low carbon economy and the empowerment of women, be the land degradation in Cameroon, like smart agriculture in Asia, or sustainable tourism in Latin America. Um, as example. And as an agricultural environmental economist, I'm also um, very uh, interested in these issues. And we are, if we are to achieve the SDGs, we must never the capacity for all of us and the synergies and stop stressing, stop addressing uh, the environment and the social issues and silos. So I want to congratulate IDRC for stacking the E and the S <laughs> on the <laughs> environment and social of the SDG. Um, as was mentioned before, women empowerment is an issue that must be mainstream across the broad range of policy areas. And my organization, UNCTAD, um, has played a role in starting to do so for trade policies. And I think it's been mentioned by uh, Luki that um, 
you know, the women do self-select based on uh, because they don't have enough time uh, because they do take care of children and their community and the elderly. Uh, so they self-select in sectors that are usually lower paid, lower growth. Um, and therefore, we, we tend to find women in these sectors concentrated. And so if you have a trade agreement that will be destroying jobs in those areas, you do affect women more. So this is an, an area that we've been looking at. Um, and women, as we did this panel mystery very well, are not passive recipients of employment opportunities. They create jobs. They, do, they are innovators and trainers and entrepreneurs. Um, and we have several examples uh, from our program, including also in, in uh, Rwanda, the digital education platform, for instance, that helps students continue to receive education online during the pandemic and others. Um, but we need innovative capacity for entrepreneurs, um, including women entrepreneurs. Um, and as was mentioned before, I think by uh, Amy, to start documenting those. Women tend to address um, they tend to be entrepreneurs by necessity mm -hmm. and lifestyle. They address the issue in their communities. Um, and yet we don't document those innovations that are usually very adapted to their local areas and the communities. Because, uh, and so we don't document them. That means we don't finance them. And that means they don't get scaled or shared with the rest of the world. And instead, we tend to finance high tech. Uh, technologies out of Cambridge and Silicon Valley that are not necessarily um, adapted for those regions. And what comes out of this, at the UN we started working on new economics for sustainable development. And I would like to mention that uh, in the tourism sector, a lot of it is, is linked to the uh, creative economy. Uh, so the, the, we are working on the orange economy, which is a creative economy out of our colleagues from uh, Colombia. Uh, we're also working on the care economy, which call, we call the purple economy. We, got, we also work on social and solidarity economy, and Luke mentioned uh, the, the community-based uh, enterprises that we're working with. So there are, are different models. Women do tend to um, also look at, at use these different types of models, uh, business model and economic model. And to be frank, with the economic model that we have right now, we are not going to be achieving all of the SDGs. At this point, we are achieving SDG 1 through uh, 7 at the expenses of SDG 5, 10, and the environmental SDGs. Um, we are also working a lot at on that entrepreneurship, and as was mentioned by uh, the three panelists, uh, we need to have specific program to women, and women entrepreneur at different level and different type. Uh, because they do see, uh, face different challenges. And it was mentioned by every panelist, putting women in touch with policymakers is extremely important. They are inherent and sometimes explicit, otherwise, otherwise expl implicit um, uh, policies and programs in, 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 that we need to raise awareness of, of, um, of the, 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 the government about. And, and also, um, Women tend to, because they are, they are uh, cash constraint and, and resource constraint, they tend to have frugal innovation, which means that you can achieve the same objective um, with lower, um, um, lower uh, financing, which means that the five trillion that we need right now to achieve the SDG could be reduced if we empower women through their uh, innovation to help us achieve the SDG. So I'll leave it at that. I know we don't have a lot of time, but this was fascinating. Thank you for all the great work you're doing on the ground and looking forward to follow on your projects and your results. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for taking the time at an airport. I think that's the, the New York airport. I hope she gets home. I hope uh, Chantaline gets home uh, safely. Um, just, I just wanted to say now she's gone, but um, just to, to sing the praises of, of, uh, of Chantal. She was um, chosen for the Idea Gen 2016 and 2020. Um, for the hundred individuals, uh, organizations empowering women and girls. Um, I just want to make a small intervention, is, if you permit me. Uh, small, yeah. Yes. Small intervention, if you permit me. If you've got a, I don't know if there's going to be a. Is there a mic? I'm not sure. No, no. No, I don't think. I don't think it's possible. Um, I don't think it's possible to because nobody will be able to hear you online. Um, yeah. I'll try to speak loudly as much as possible. Okay. So, you know, so uh, I will be, 
I'm CEO of an uh, international organization based in Montreal. It's called ZMP Global. And we have come from India. We have been working in India for 25 years. And we have scaled our program from India to Afghanistan and East Africa. And the objective is here to come to scale programs in Frankfurt country. So, so when we're talking about women entrepreneurship, and, and you know, so, you know, I think there are three big issues, three big barriers. One is, one is definitely the gender inequity, right? So, so I think this is the first barrier we have to fight out. Second is, is employability and livelihood generation for women. So, you know, you know, we have seen that, for example, a woman earns half as, as men, and they were first to lose the job in COVID. So, you know, so obviously we have to work on entrepreneurship development of women so that they also give jobs. Then third step will be how we can bring in those innovation and, you know, and adopting low carbon, you know, uh, economy, you know, uh, achieving that. But first, we have to achieve first and second step, right? And I, step step. I think I'm going to have to stop you because nobody else can hear you. I don't, I don't think, it can, unless you've got a, a, do you have a specific question that I could then repeat in my, in my microphone? See, Did you? See, my question is that, you know, you know, how do we plan to do it in step? Because, you know, if you just talk of low carbon economy achieving that, you know, how do we first overcome the two barriers which we have? So the, the question is, how do we overcome the, the barriers to low carbon economy in, in a stepped process? And we have, no, no. so we have two barriers. First is, is gender inequity in our part of the world, whether Asia or Africa. And second is, uh, the livelihood opportunity for women and, and entrepreneurship development. So, so it has to be in steps. Okay, so I think what you're saying is that it has to be in steps. This, the, the, um, that the um, women's economic empowerment within the low carbon transition has to be done in steps. Yeah, first yeah. Okay. great. I, I, yes, unfortunately, this panel didn't really allow for for uh, the, the audience participation just because of logistical issues. Um, so, but thank thank you for for the intervention. Anyway, sorry for the rest of you that couldn't couldn't hear uh, hear what they were saying. Um, but on the, on that now we we've come to the end of our f very short fifty minute discussion, and I, I would just really wanted to thank the panelists for for all the work that they're doing in this space watch this space I think if you're wanting to learn more information about some of these projects they're on um, IDRC's website which is easy to find idrc.ca and of course I wanted to also thank um, Julie Scholdeis for for giving the opening re remarks and uh, and to Chantal Lin so uh, wonderful to uh, to be here and uh, I look forward to engaging with some of you uh, uh, afterwards. Thank you.